Welcome, everybody. It's so good for us to be able to gather once again. Uh, I think the beautiful thing about the church family is that's really the calling of God, that we may be a family. And uh, this church is so active. This, this uh, family of faith is very, very active. There's so much going on. We got kids camp coming up. There's family camp going on. Uh, every Sunday there's gatherings. Throughout the week there are so many ways to get plugged in. And if you want to really get plugged in and be part of this local church and find a way to serve, there's so many opportunities. So please reach out if you, uh, if you definitely want to get more plugged in and be part of all that is happening here. I think one of the biggest things that we, uh, that kind of unite us obviously is the blood of Jesus Christ. But what unites us all as well as a family is uh, we get to spend not just our time here on Sundays together, but we have all of eternity. I sometimes wonder what that's going to be like. There's going to be a moment where, where we're in heaven and we're going to see someone from earth. I just imagine what, the, what that's going to be like. Am I going to fist bump someone in heaven that's, you know, that I knew here on earth? Uh, are you, you going to hug them? Like, how, what's the relationship going to be there? But that's one of the beautiful things. God has made us eternal. And he has placed eternity in our hearts. He's written it there. Isn't that absolutely incredible? God has written eternity on our hearts. You were made for that. That's why this earth doesn't feel like home. You're made for more than this one earth here. And so sometimes while we're here on earth, it feels like, you know, life can get complicated. But as I was driving yesterday and I was driving again this morning, I had this one simple thought that kept going through my mind. It's like, no, actually life is actually quite simple if you really think about it. You know, it's, you hope that you can, you know, survive the high school stage and not pick up too much, you know, bad stuff. Uh, and you get plugged into youth ministry. And then from there, you know, hopefully you can meet someone that you could marry and build a life with. Um, that you could have children and raise them for the glory of God. That you could raise them well. That they can also meet someone that loves Jesus. That they could get plugged in, into a local church. That you could have a good job and provide for your family. That you could have good health and you pray about these kind of things. And so you start breaking down or compartmentalizing all little facets of life. And then you plug the book of wisdom or the book of Proverbs into this whole dynamic of life here on earth. And you go, okay, if I really want to have a good life. If I really want to honor God with it all, then I need to like just slow down. And I need to begin to like really think about not just the journey, but the outcome. And I, I, I apply this to my own self because life seems to be slowing down a little bit right here in my mind. And the way I want to live. I know I, wanted, I know I want my children to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, be, and therefore I slow down. I go, okay, if I want that, I need to sit down and get to their level I got to share the gospel with them. I need to open the word with them. I need to walk through life with them. I need to answer questions. That changes the dynamic of my day. I know I want to be a great provider for my family, so that means I'm going to work hard. I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to try to be a specialist in, in whatever I am good at, whatever you're good at, to be the best at it so that you could provide, make money, and feed your family, provide housing for the family. You know you want to have a great marriage? You know, you want there to be romance in your marriage. You know, you want there to be happiness there. So you take steps there. You slow down. You go, how do I attain this? Oh, she likes this. She loves it when I bring flowers. Or he loves it when I share words of affirmation. By the way, ladies, that's a huge thing for guys. The more guys I speak to, they just love words of affirmation. Honestly, I feel like I could put a cape on anytime Natalie starts reaffirming me or, or complimenting me. I feel like I can conquer the world. Like I can accomplish anything like like I just hit the gym and I pumped iron and I feel great. Like just words of affirmation, they do so much for men. But anyways, just going back to that train of thought, we find what even our spouse loves and what they enjoy and you take proactive steps to serve them and love on them and, then, and cultivate that relationship. You date your spouse. You love on them. You know you want to have a generous heart so you slow down and consider what that's going to be like. Okay, I'm going to set aside my, my 10% of finances before I even spend it. I'm going to put that aside first. I want to be generous with my finances, with my time. I want to get plugged in the local church. I want to serve and give back. So you begin to break down again and you categorize and compartmentalize life here on earth. And you go, actually, it's really quite simple if you really break it down. If you really slow it down. You know, if I even use uh, the relationship between a husband and wife, uh, you know, just marriage in general, you go, okay, if I want to have a good life, I don't want to have uh, issues in my marriage, I'm definitely going to stay away from 
viewing porn. I'm definitely going to stay away from thinking of other women. I'm definitely going to make sure I compliment only her. I'm not looking to the left or to the right. I'm looking at her. I'm definitely seeking to have the word of God be at the center of, of, that, of that relationship. I'm going to place God first. I'm going to have honesty in my relationship with my, with my spouse. And you really start considering what does it take? What work do I got to put into it? And again, it kind of demystifies, it simplifies what life should look like on earth. Because sometimes life feels foggy. Like, what do I do now? What's the next step? And again, once you just take a piece of paper, you write out what's important to you, and you go, okay, how do I begin applying the wisdom of God into this part of my life? God will tell you. The reality is most of the times we already know what we need to do. It's hard to do it. Most of the time we already know. We know what steps we got to take. We know what we need to remove from our lives. We, need, we know what we need to begin adding to our lives. But it takes that hard work. It takes that decision. And then it takes that persistence to carry it out. So the passage, sorry, this is a long introduction to uh, Proverbs 9. But the passage that, co- that comes instantly to mind uh, when I was thinking about all these things. And again, that's been on my mind a lot. It's been on my mind, mind a lot when I speak at youth services because I feel like I just... I just really want to get it through to our young people. Like, don't choose anything other than Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have everything. And he's going to align your path. And he's going to make it straight. And you're never going to regret serving him. You're never going to regret doing it his way. You're never going to regret honoring him with your purity. And you're never going to regret being honest in your work and all things. If you just honor the Lord, you'll be a happy person. Whether you have a lot or you have little, you will be a happy person. You'll be a joyful person in the Lord. So just trying to portray that because, you know, they already hear so many sermons. And then the last Sunday, the, the, the introduction was really, ah, so what? You hear all these sermons, you know so much, you've been exposed at Sunday school, in middle school ministries, mountain movers, and, and now at youth service, you've heard so many things. The question is always then, like, so what, what do I do with this? How do you package it up? How do you take it? And it started kind of breaking it down into simple things like, how do you, how do you carry this into your school, into your workplace, into your dating, into your relationship to your mom and dad? How do you take the word and how do you package it and use it? That's ultimately what's important. We want to take the word. We want to use it. We want to have a good life. We want to have a life that honors the Lord. We want to finish well and go, ah, that was good. So 1 Corinthians comes to mind because, again, the reality is we all know. We know a lot. But now it means application. So you hear these words. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training and they do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So there's two things that really stand out here. Number one is life is not easy. Can anybody relate? You got to go, you got to push, you got to get up for work every day. Those of you who are in other seasons, maybe not yet, but that's coming. Uh, kids are amazing. They're, they're such a joy, but it's not easy. You got to get up. You got to move. You got to, you got to discipline. You got to raise. You got to instruct. You got to be patient. You got to instill. Like there's, life is not easy, but it is so rewarding. So, but this, the word here is just run, have that perseverance, just push forward. God loves you. God has a plan for your life, but it means getting up every day and saying, God, thank you for this day that you've made. Let me not waste it. Let me live it well. I am all in. Having that mentality just brings life to your day. It brings life to your relationships. Because I believe that there are those who were running the race in this room. But you're sitting on the sidelines now. Somehow you got exhausted along the way. You didn't get hydrated with the word of God enough. And then you just... just, took a pause, you took a break, you, you believe in Jesus, you, you love Jesus, but something happened in your life that you just, ah, you feel like you're in survival mode. Get going from one day to the next. So that part of your life that's slowed down, that part of your life that's maybe broken, pray about that now as you're sitting here. And if you're on the sidelines today, 
Just pray out to the Lord as you're sitting here. God, I want to get back and run with you. I want to be an ambassador of yours. I want to get back and fulfill my calling as a husband. I want to be there. Or maybe some wives who are sitting here, they're just maybe just exhausted, having so many little ones in the house. And, oh, I'm just tired. May God just give you that strength to say, just wake up and get back into it. It's not easy, but God is with you. He'll give you the strength. He gives us enough strength for every day. If you've lost some battles, God is saying there's hope and there's forgiveness available to every single person. Just come. Come, draw near. I will strengthen you. I will heal you. And I'll put you back in the race. But it's a beautiful race. It's a relationship with the Lord. It's moving through earth here. But God gives us books like Proverbs where we could run in a way that is full of wisdom. Again, we want kochma. That's the word, which is skill and applied knowledge. In the Exodus 31, 1 through 3, we have this, this introduction to, to wisdom, which is, then the Lord said to Moses, see, I've chosen Bazel, uh, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, and the tri tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and all kinds of skills. God has given us his spirit. God wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us understanding. He wants to give us knowledge, but all of it leads to skill. So knowledge is one thing. Wisdom is another. Wisdom is the ability to take that knowledge as we've spoken and apply it into everyday life. It is to deconstruct it and is actually able to apply it in everyday living. It is skill. It is applied knowledge. How do I gain wisdom in my life? How do I begin applying it? And again, many of us already know what to do. We got to take that first step and get back into the race and begin running again. And so today we're in chapter 9. Uh, today is the last chapter of a section, which is like phase one or section one in the book of Proverbs. The first nine chapters, as we spoke already of, they have these letters like, my son, listen to me. Listen closely. Draw near. And we know we can listen to Solomon. We know we can listen to the author who's writing these words because as we've had an uh, introduction of chapter one, this was a king. And he was known as one who had incredible knowledge and incredible wisdom from the Lord. And God blessed him with it. He gifted him with it. And he was around the most wisest of those at, uh, really alive at that time. And he was also the son of a king who was also exposed to the most incredible teachers, the most w wise men in, in all of the realm, so to say, in all of the kingdom. He was, he would be an expert. This is the person that we would want to learn from. You know, sometimes you go to a college, for example, whether it's Clark or WSU or whatever it is, and there might even be a business course that you could take. And, the, and, and it's funny because there are some business courses that you can take, but the instructor, the professor has never owned a business. They've never built a business, but they're teaching on the subject. And that's how it is with life. So often you can be around someone who, who knows the things. They know extreme amounts of information, but they simply have not lived it out. They simply have not applied it and done anything with it. Like this is someone who has been exposed to the wisest, and then he's, he's applied it. He's tried this. I've tried that. And now I want to take all of this weight of what I learned, and I want to give it to you. And so now these letters are being written like to us son. My son, come close. I want to teach you. And so we all kind of drew near in these last few months. And now we're at chapter nine. We're ending this, this section. And then we're going to go into section number two in two weeks, because next week we will have a guest speaker. Uh, his name is Bogdan Kipko. He's going to come visit us and speak to us. Um, so again, in two weeks, we're going to go into section chapter two. Section two is chapter 10. So let's do this. I'm going to read the first section. There's three sections in chapter nine. The first one is verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bibles, please open them. The book of Proverbs, chapter 9, the first six verses. Wisdom has built her house, and she has set up seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants and calls from the highest point of the city. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. So we have this 
passage before us, and we have this call of wisdom. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 are the calls of lady wisdom. So like, wisdom has this portrayal of, of a woman who's calling out for wisdom. And in the previous chapters, we had the call of folly, which is in the form of a seductive woman who would lead you astray, who would take the simple, and she would lead them to the point of death. And that's really what today's chapter actually ends with. In fact, let me just read that very last verse because it provides that massive context. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. Like that's what it ends with. That's the end. That's the conclusion of the person who chooses folly. They don't want wisdom from God. They don't want to do things his way. They are set on doing it my way, even at the expense of others or whatnot. They've chosen folly. They have chosen not to be wise. While wisdom is saying, like making her own call. And so God is making this call to us. And, and we hear these, these analogies of, of what's there, what's going to be taking place at this invitation. And so here it is again. First of all, we see that there are seven pillars. Let me just read that again. So you see it. She has set up seven pillars. We see a solid foundation. We see a building that's being invited into that is steady that is consistent, that will withstand a storm. I think we all want that. We want a life that is built on a solid foundation. The pillars are set. The floor is solid. The walls are being built straight. The roof that is covering is going to keep the, the storm, the, the rain out, the hail out. The wind is not going to get through the cracks. You have a solid foundation and a home that will not fall. We want that. That's what wisdom offers us. Build a life that is steady, that is consistent, that is strong, that has a solid foundation. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. So that now the, the invite is coming in. Now she has her meat and she has mixed her wine. Mixed wine meaning it's not strong, meaning it's not going to change your behavior, means it's not going to change how you act, how you think. You're going to stay sharp. You're going to stay intellectual. You're going to stay on guard. And now you're being fed. You're enjoying. And uh, now these servants have gone out and they've made the calls from the highest point of the city. And this, and this invitation is made to all who will listen. Like we keep hearing this, this invitation, like it sounds like it's everywhere. Like, like God is making his point, he's proving his point. He's like, hey, I have, I, my son has died for every single person. All who would confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior would be saved. All who want wisdom could obtain it. Those who want to escape the folly of this world, you have access to wisdom. The call is made. But if you remember in last chapter, which is absolutely incredible for me, it was like this aha moment in chapter eight where it said, okay, like wisdom is calling out. It's by the gate. It's at the entry of the city. It's in, in, in the public spaces. But then it says, go physically move yourself. Get exposed to that front gate. Go up to that mountain. Go where that proclamation is being made meaning we got to pursue it too. Wisdom doesn't happen to us. A great marriage doesn't, you don't just happen upon a great marriage. You don't just happen on a, a, a wonderful relationship with your children. You don't just happen upon a great habit of, of being in the word daily and being in prayer. It doesn't happen. Our flesh is resistant to these things. The enemy does not want you to have a good life. The enemy wills destruction for you. He wants an unsteady building, something that's tossed to and fro. He wants you to be bitter towards your spouse. He wants broken relationships. The enemy wants a generational curse upon your family. He wants you to mess up so your kids mess up and that their kids would mess up. That's what he wants. But our God is the one who destroys those generational curses. He transforms our lives and he wants your children to be blessed by your life. Because look at this, as you bless your children, as you honor the Lord, as you have a wonderful marriage and you pursue that, your children see that. And your children, not only are they gonna build their own life, but they are gonna have a massive impact on their environment around them, whether it's at school or work or whatnot. God wills that for you. 
So he wants to take what is broken. He wills to fix it. God will heal what has been hurt. God will transform lives. There are many testimonies in this room with someone who maybe didn't have a good upbringing, but God transformed you and he broke that generational curse and you have a good life going. And you praise the Lord for that. And you just say, oh, God, I just really want, I just want my kids to know you. Oh, if they know you, I'm set, I'm good, I'm happy. If they could know you as personal Savior and they can walk with you before you in fear and walk with you in joy, ah, oh, I've done well. That's what I want, God, please. And so I know that there's parents probably in this room as well who are worried about your children. May God just protect them. May God lead them. May God lead every child in this church that they might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they might have beautiful marriages, might have beautiful careers, that they might have beautiful hearts that serve the Lord, who are hearts that are generous, hearts that are good, souls that will make it to heaven. Wisdom calls into this relationship, into this communion, into this family where there's something to eat, there's something to drink, to enjoy, where there's a solid foundation, a life that will not be moved, a life that will not be easily swayed. Wisdom gives us knowledge applied. Applied knowledge leads to convictions. It leads to a point of view that is rooted and grounded in the word and is not easily swayed. I think that's one of the issues today in general. We, we are uh, raised in a culture that preaches tolerance, love everybody, accept everyone, everything is okay. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. And so we're, we're almost taught by culture today not to have convictions. No, there's only one way, that's Jesus. You can't say that. Look at the Muslims here. Look at this group over here. Look at the Mormons over here. You have Jehovah Witnesses. Like, like every, they're all good too. That's a whole other conversation. We can, we can dig into that. But the idea is our culture, whether it's gender identity. In fact, uh, millennials are saying, according to a recent survey, 30% identify as something other than their own gender. It's absolutely incredible. Incredibly sad, really. Our culture tells us don't have convictions. Our, t- our culture tells us to sway with the wind and go as the culture changes. Our God says, have a sure and steady foundation. Know where you're going. Be solid. Know what you stand on. Because without convictions, you don't have follow through. Have you noticed that? If you don't have a conviction that it is important to honor the Lord in your parenting and that your children would know the word, you will never read with them unless it's a conviction. Because you're not going to wake up one day and be like, okay, I think from now on, while the kids are in the home, I'm going to make sure I pray with them every day and read the word just because I want to. It sounds like fun. It's not going to happen like that. It it comes out of a conviction of a knowledge of where you're going, what you want to accomplish, what the Lord wills to accomplish in your life. And then you begin to stand on that and you begin to be immovable. You fight for it. You strive for it. You move in that direction. There's no other way. If it's going to be generosity, If it's going to be missions, you make a conviction and you build your life around these convictions that you have. The Lord wills for us to have applied wisdom, applied knowledge leading to wisdom in the form of convictions, which is steady, which is persistent, and it actually gets lived out. So which part of your life, if you were to name one part of your life today, you say, God, I need more In this part, is it your finances? Is it your health? Is it your marriage? Is it your parenting? Is it the the way that you think? Which part of your life is in the way? Which part is lacking? Because here's the reality. This portion, the first six verses that we read, it ends with this. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. If we were to choose wisdom today, It means giving up something. It means giving up a simple way. And the simple way is one that lacks conviction. A simple way is one that lacks the ability to sit down and to really think and to plan and to strategize and have difficult conversations and to plan and to set out schedules and to really push in a certain direction. A simple life says, we'll see what today brings. It's okay. 
I'm very easygoing. It's all right. I don't need much. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be influential in this world. That's not my calling. It's okay. My ki- as long as my kids, you know, survive, <laughs> they'll, they'll be fine. My, my marriage, it's okay. Yeah, we're not the happiest. You know, we're kind of two people living under one roof, but it's okay. Some people got it worse. Like, let's put away all this simplicity, all this stuff that God did not call upon your life, and you'll say, God, what is your calling over me? I want to live that out. And that means living out, leaving behind simple ways. Simple ways are lazy ways. The passage that comes to my mind is actually um, in Proverbs chapter 6, if you remember. The passage about the ant not having a master, not having someone dictate his schedule, but yet this ant is willing to get up and push and work hard and prepare and to do the work that is needed. And here's the passage just so you see it. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. It gives us this idea that simplicity is laziness. That's not the, it's, you don't have the, the desire and the fight for your family. You don't have the desire to get up an extra 30 minutes early and prepare for the day and make sure, ah, did I pray for my family? Did I, did I prepare myself mentally for, for work? Did I prepare myself mentally to greet my kids and to encourage them as the day is beginning? Did I, am, am I putting the work in? Am I ready to push? Am I ready to leave the simplicity behind and do the work that I need? A good life is not inherited. A great marriage is not inherited. Great relationships are not inherited. A great business is not inherited. All things that are good are not inherited. It takes a lot of work. So I hope that the, in point number one that we can all walk away with this mindset of, you know what, I'm going to, I need to, I just relaxed. My hands have come down. My legs have relaxed. I'm no longer running the race. I got to get back into it. And you come to the Lord first and you say, God, awaken my heart. Awaken my mind. Where, is, where did this laziness come from? Where did this lack of care come from? Remove it from my heart. Give me a, a heart of flesh. Give, me, like, give life to my bones. Give life to my mind. Wake me up, God. I think there are many in this room that just need to just snap out of it and wake up. And we come to the Lord first and say, God, revive my heart. God, revive my affections for my spouse. God, revive my desire to leave my family. God, revive me that I could, in every room that I come in, I come as a person of blessing. Revive the light that you have called over my life, that we would be a light to every person in every room that we walk into. God, revive me. Give me passion. Give me joy. Give me excitement for life. God can do that for you. If you're dealing with depression or sadness, God can do that for you. If you're dealing with brokenness in relationships, God can do that for you. God, if you, if laziness has took over, God can awaken you. He can give you strength. Let's go ahead and, into number two. Portion number two, we're going to read from uh, verse seven through nine. Now, if you look here, uh, it's a shorter portion, but whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. I love this passage because it shows that there's this educational piece to life. Again, life means putting the work in. I think this is something that almost like, kind of rarely gets spoken of from the pulpit. Because, you know, obviously we preach Jesus and amen. That's who we love. That's who we serve. That's the one we walk with. We thank the Lord for the spirit of God that's within us. But so often I feel like when we hear sermons, it's, not, it's kind of disconnected from our, from our relationships, from our work, from the things that our, our hands touch on a daily basis. And it's especially when it comes to complex relationships. Because the reality is this. For example, why do people lie? People lie because they don't want to face consequences. They don't want to have difficult conversations. Maybe, maybe, let's put it this way. 
husband or wife sees something that their spouse should not be doing. But they don't have the grit, they don't have the humility, they don't have the, they don't have the desire to confront them in love and have a hard conversation. Or maybe a husband messed up, did something he shouldn't have had done, but he doesn't have the, just this desire to come and just be vulnerable and share it with his spouse and to apologize maybe for offending his spouse or whatever it is, because he doesn't want to have the hard conversations, doesn't want to have difficulty, wants to just have the ease. Everything should be happy. I love, you know, no conflict. Let's enjoy life. Let's have it. But in reality, our growth, a lot of our maturing, a lot of our growth takes place when we have difficult conversations, loving conversations, where we dig a little bit and we uproot garbage that's taking part in our lives. And I think it happens, first of all, between husband and wife, children and parents. That's a beautiful dynamic. It happens uh, when those who are serving together, they can, they can have that as well. Friendships are beautiful opportunities for this. Obviously, uh, right now we're talking about convicting people in love. Uh, so obviously, uh, we shouldn't just be walking around to strangers, you know, people we don't have really good relationships with and be like, hey, you suck at this. You're really bad at this. You're awful. You're, you're bad at like, That's not the call here. The call is actually quite simple because if you look at this again, uh, whoever corrects a mocker invites insult. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. So there are, you have these two things that take place to to, uh, help you identify a person who is not wise. This is a person who insults someone who corrects them, number one. Number two is they hate those who correct them. So that's a foolish person. The opposite or the wise person loves those who rebuke them. That's That's a polar opposite. And then they, they grow in that wisdom by applying the corrections and they are willing to learn from those who would teach them. So the first portion, I want to have a good, steady, solid foundation. There are seven pillars. There's, a, there's plenty there. There's a great fellowship there. There's a, a, a great community there. I want to have that. But in order to have that, I need to be willing to come into that community and be teachable and to learn and to be able to take things that are hard and difficult to hear sometimes. Because I'm not perfect, no one in this room is perfect, and we all have areas that are blind sites. You know, I've shared this story once, I'll share it again. There's this, there's this example of this, you know, man who was co- that came into a coffee shop to have an important meeting. And then uh, he's sitting there eating, and then uh, the, another young man sees him, and he sees a big glob of cream cheese on his mustache. And he's like, ooh, he's dressed up nice. He's got a nice suit, the tie. He's probably there for a really important meeting. I should say something to him. And then sure enough, two very important looking individuals walk in. And this guy gets up, has no idea. He has cream cheese all over his face. And he goes into meet, into this meeting and no one told him. We all have these cream cheese moments, these, these blind spot moments. And how good is it that we have a brother or a sister or a parent, a friend, a spouse that would come up beside us and be like, I love you. Yeah, cream cheese all over your face. Like, we got to talk about this. Like, have these heart-to-heart conversations, these really meaningful moments where we can take correction in, we can invite it, we can accept it, we can learn from it, and then we can grow in having that accountability in our lives. I think uh, there's obviously been a lot of difficult conversations between, say, even spouses or parents and children or even friends. But hopefully it's not just conflicts, but rather it's these proactive conversations of Jesus loves you. And I see that there's something going on in your life right now. And I really want to talk to you. I want to offend you, but I, I, I got to say this with love. And this is what I see. Am I wrong? Because I really care about you. I really care about your soul. And the person hears and they go, thank you. I love you for telling me. I know you love me because you told me. See, love, one of the evidences of love is to be able to say the the truth in a loving way. Because if you really care about the people in your life, then you, you want their life to be beautiful and you want their relationships to be beautiful and you want their eternity to be secure. And so you tell them the hard things. And hopefully they're gonna say, I love you and I know you love me because you've told me the hard thing. The fool will not say so. The fool will insult you. The fool will hate you for correcting them. That's the identifying piece. 
If today you have a hardness in your heart where you hate and you insult those who correct you, it means you're not teachable. It means your heart has pride and you're not willing to turn away from evil, not willing to turn from sin, not willing to turn away from things that might be hurting you. Yes, sure, there are obviously situations where people um, might be too aggressive, maybe don't do it with love or maybe with judgment, but accept it. Say, Lord, you even allowed that. So I'm going I'm 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 to listen, I'm going to take it in, and I'm going to see if there's something there. And then I'm going to pray about it. And if there is, I want to respond to that. I want to respond to the Lord and make sure that I'm not missing out on an opportunity to grow. Our growth in that steady life takes place in moments where we begin to uproot pride, uproot areas of sin, and we begin to move on from it and accept, apply wisdom and move in the direction of the Lord to be able to move in the direction of our King. And it really gets summarized here. So now we're at, we got the first two sections done. And we have this little pause. And this pause is beautiful because this, this line, the same line keeps going through all of Proverbs. And it is this in verses 10 and 11. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Came back to it. We started with that and we're continuing with it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then it goes on to say, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding for through wisdom, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. We've talked about this in, in one sense where, you know, you might not have a very long life. You might not long to year, live to 100 years old or you might not live to be 80 years old. But this long life that's being discussed here, it's not just years of your life. It is years of your influence. It is years of the impact that you would have. One person can live 20 years and they can outlive someone who is 100 years old by the impact of their life. The things that they, the way that they have impacted those who are around them, the way that they've impacted them for eternity. There could be someone, again, very long, very fulfilling life, maybe had a lot of stuff, but eternally bankrupt. Whereas someone could be very young and they could go early but they could have a very full, full, fulfilling life. May God give you a fulfilling life, a full life, a generous life, a great marriage, a great relationships. May God give you these. May God, may God gift you them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We just come to the Lord and we have this deep awe and reverence of him. We go, ah, oh God, you are... Incredible. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I tell my kids all the time, girls, if you have the fear of the Lord, if you just see how amazing he is, you have that reverence for him, that's going to protect you. That's going to lead you. That's going to guide you. And if you have love for the Lord, you love him with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, you will have no need. God will provide for you. God will lead you. You have those two things, my job is done. The fear of the Lord and love for him. That's all. God will take care of the rest. God will lead them. God will produce for them. God will protect them. God will help give them wisdom to make the right decisions in life if they have the fear of the Lord and have love for him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. And let's go to the last part. The last part is the end product or it's like the conclusion. So verses 12 through 18. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. I love that. If you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. Folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who will pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. Do you see that contrast between Lady Wisdom and this, this foolish woman calling out? One is saying, like, so many contrasts here. One is saying, go work hard. Look at the ant. Put the work in. Try your best. Work really hard. This one is saying, oh, stolen water is sweet. 
You don't got to work. Just relax. Come. We're going to go and rob. We're going to go and take advantage of Romans. I mean, uh, in Proverbs chapter 1 talks about that and chapter 2 as well. Let's just go and take advantage of others. We don't need to work hard. Let's just indulge in life. Let's be lazy. Let's relax. Let's let our guard down. Let's be perverted. Let's do horrible things to other people and to our own selves. Like the contrast is massive. And it says the contrast, yet when you want to look at an actual contrast, you look at the end life. You look at what the life had produced. If you remember in a few years ago, there's two men that died. They were both very old. And they had severely, massively different lives. One was Billy Graham and the other was Hugh. Heifer, right? That's the last name. Uh, completely two different lives. One had this generational impact, massive movement for the glory of God, while the other one enslaved millions of people to porn. Massively different lives. One had reconciled relationships, got people into heaven and out of hell, restored marriages, relationships, got depression out, got addiction out. The other life broke marriages, got addiction into people's lives, broke generations, had generational curses, opened a whole can of worms into the adult industry world. Massively different lives. And you, when you want to see the byproduct of it all, you look at the conclusion. You go, where do I want to end my life? For me, this is one of the most telling things on a personal level. How do I, win, how do I want to live my life on a day-to-day? I want to look at the conclusion. I want to look at the end point. What do I want? What does God want for my life? Where do I want my kids to end up? And then you start pivoting all over and you start making different decisions by looking at the end. Because look, the end is here. Death. Deep in the realm of death. There are two who are calling out to you today. I want to be able to end with this. There's a call throughout the first nine chapters of Proverbs. And it's like a father to a son saying, come, I just want to teach you. Just stay here. Just stay here in the fear of the Lord. Just don't move beyond this. Like, just stay with him. Oh, he's not going to, I mean, he's going to prepare you. He's going he's gonna to make you strong. He's going to make you influential. He's going to give you success. Everything you touch is going to be blessed. You're going to have beautiful relationships. You're going to have a beautiful, steady life. You're going to be, it's going to be good. You're going to have the good life. But there's this competing voice that's screaming to you all the time. Come to me. Come to me. Come, just relax. Let your guard down. Integrity, who needs that? No one saw. No one's going to see. No one's going to know. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. Two completely different calls of life. And the pivot out of darkness and into light takes incredible humility. It takes incredible sacrifice. It means opening and shedding light on all the sin in your life. Maybe telling somebody. Maybe drawing near to the Lord and saying, God, I'm ready. I got to get out of this darkness. I got to get out of this realm of this adulteress. I got to get out of here. I want that life. God, won't you just please get me out of there? A massive pivot needs to take place. And it's possible. We believe in a God who resurrects. We believe in a God who resurrected and he's resurrecting us. And then what he does is as he gets a hold of your heart, he begins to resurrect parts of your life. So he takes care of one and you look back and go, wow, I used to curse. I don't curse anymore. This is great. And then some more time goes by, I go, wow, I used, to, I used to have such a vile thought, such horrible thinking. And it's gone. It's gone. Thank you, God. And you, be, you get to just bless him and you praise him. And then you go, oh, I used to be so angry. People that would convict me or just say anything I didn't like, I used to just unleash and yell at them. It's gone. God, thank you. I'm so thankful that you've removed that from my life. Whatever, all these different parts, we begin to see this steady change. God is in the process of resurrecting another part of your life today. Which part is it? What is broken today that you need to bring to the Lord and say, God, this part, won't you just breathe life into it? Just as you were there in creation and you breathed life into Adam, won't you just breathe life into me? Won't you just give me hope and inspiration and joy? Won't you just inspire me to be the best in all parts of my commitments? in all parts of my relationship. Won't you inspire me? Won't you just breathe into me generosity, God? Just give me that desire to just to give and to give and to give and to love and to love and not expect anything back. God, won't you just produce that in me? Because we want to be sanctified, which is to look more like Jesus and less like ourselves. God, I want to look like you and less like me. 
Change me, transform me, work in me. I want that. Let's stand. Let's pray about that. Pray specifically about the areas that the enemy is attacking you in. What areas? Pinpoint it right now. God, this area is under attack in my life. The enemy is going hard right here. The enemy wants to destroy me. Just pray about that right now. Maybe if you have your spouse with you, just, just hold their hand and ask them, hey, just pray. I can t- we can talk about it later. We can have a hard conversation later. Maybe if your kids are near, just give them a hug. Just pray over them. Pray over them that, that they might know the Lord Jesus, that they might have a, lo- a life of blessing. They might walk in fear before him. May our church, may this family of faith have strong families with a solid foundation, a strong church that is committed to the next generation, a strong church that's willing to look outside of the walls of the church and say, come, come on in, come on in, you're invited. Come, leave sin, leave death behind, come find life here. But that all begins in our homes. It all begins in our thought lives. It all begins in our marriages and in our parenting. May God lead you, may God bless you. 